So happy to see each of you today in our class on Hebrews. We don't have many times left. We're getting near the end, but I think it's been a good book. I don't know. Uh, we're on page 48 of your notes. Number two, C, chastening and incentive to faith. And though we've done 11, we're going to start with 11. All right. Would you read 11 for us, please? 12, 11. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peace, able fruit of righteousness, Sorry, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, what we have to realize is we have to look to the result of chastening more than the process of chastening. All right. It says no chastening for the present. In other words, while it's going on, it isn't. A happy thing. Uh, rather, it's hurtful and uh, is something that we don't rejoice in at all. All right. I can remember my mother telling about my older sister when my mother was trying to teach her to be, she had to learn to be quiet in church. She couldn't just let uh, let her do whatever she wanted to do and disrupt the service. Uh, in those days, there were no children's church. You brought your children with you into the main service. And when she kept acting up, she told her, she said, Mama's going to have to spank you if you keep doing like this. You have to be quiet when you're here in church. And uh, when she didn't listen, she smacked her and um, she said her response was, Mama, that hurt. Yes, it was supposed to hurt. Um, it says no chastening is joyous. It's If it makes you laugh, it makes you enjoy it, you're not going to learn the lesson that you're supposed to learn. All right. Uh, and so it says, Nevertheless, afterwards, all right, um, th this has to do with uh, when it says it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those or them that are exercised thereby, those that are trained by it. It's actually talking here about in Greek, the world of athletics, where they train them, all right, and they have to go through a lot of things that maybe brings agony, uh, and so it is when God is training his spiritual athletes, all right, God always has a purpose when he is allowing something in our life. I remember when I was uh, in Penang many, many years ago. And, you know, we were running this um, Tamil Bible Institute. But I woke up one day with a real bad headache. I mean, it was so bad. There was just no trying to get away from it. And I couldn't go to school. And that headache lasted for almost a week. It was so unbearable. I couldn't read. I couldn't do anything. After a few days, I remember saying to my husband, I just can't read my Bible. I'm not able to see it. So please find me some tapes where I can listen to tapes. At least I can by my ear take in uh, God's word and somebody preaching to me. So he found me three tapes. Uh, I didn't kind of like the looks of two of them by their name. And uh, 
there was one that I thought, well, this sounds a bit interesting, but I couldn't get it to work. It absolutely would not play. And in the end, only one of them would play. And it was the one I really didn't want. It had to do with unforgiveness. And I just wasn't that interested in that tape. But that's the only one that would play. And, you know, through that tape, God showed me that I had unforgiveness in my life because I had always felt, you know, if I'm upset, if I'm angry, all you have to do is say sorry. If you'll admit you're wrong, I will be quick to forgive you. But in this case, the Lord showed me that whoever I was upset with, I didn't even know who they were. It was just kind of they, them, you know, the leaders of our organization. I was upset with them. I didn't know who exactly I was upset with, but I was upset with verdicts that they had given concerning my husband and myself. And God showed me there's no way they're going to come and say sorry to you and ask you to forgive them because they don't even know you're upset with them. So are you going to forgive them or not? And, you know, when I finally got around and started to understand that we have to forgive people whether or not they say sorry to us, all right? We need to forgive them and let them off the hook, uh, just like God did for us, you know, no matter what we've done, how we've done it, how many times we've done it, he has forgiven us and let us off the hook. And so when I got around to really forgiving from my heart, the moment I did, this headache was gone. I never had that headache again. And uh, it was a hard lesson. It was a bitter lesson. All right. But it says in the end, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness is not just something we say, oh, I have the righteousness of Christ. He's given me his righteousness. I don't have my own. Uh, there is righteousness in our life will yield fruit. It will show things to let us know that we are in the way of the Lord, that we're walking the way the Lord would walk that certain things in our life, when it happens, we realize that is not following God at all. We're not abiding in his righteousness. We're not following his righteousness. And so it says here, afterward, God's correction, uh, this is actually what um, David Guzik said, it's a spanking from heaven. It smarts, all right? But we must look beyond the process to the result. The result does not come immediately, but afterward, afterward, it yieldeth, all right? Many believers are deeply grieved because they do not at once feel they have been profited by the afflictions, all right? But you don't expect when you plant a seed, an apple seed or a plum seed or like that, you don't expect right after a week to see fruit coming out. Fruit takes time, but the things we go through will help that later on in our life, then our life begins to bear that fruit. Think about David of old, when he was just a young boy and he was tending the sheep, God allowed a lion and God allowed a bear to attack. And um, he overcame them by trusting in the Lord. And he could have thought, 
what was that all about? Why didn't God protect me from them? Why did God allow these things to come into my life? But it trained him and it helped him so that many years down the line, when he faced Goliath, the, the giant, the Philistine, because of the victory God gave him over the bear and over the lion, his faith was strengthened to a place where he could say the God that overcame, shut the lion's mouth and the bear's mouth, uh, that same God will give you into my hand as well. His faith had been strengthened that it would bear fruit uh, down the line. It wasn't immediately all right. Um, so uh, there is an application for this, all right. Um, there's four things that I'm going to put here, and then I will tell them as I go along, all right. The application, get strong, get right, get bold, and watch out, all right. I'll read that again. The application for this is get strong, get right, get bold, and watch out. So 12 and 13, would you read those for us? Yes. Hebrews 12, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. All right, so these two verses, we're going to apply that first one. Take encouragement, be strong, get strong, all right? Wherefore, as a result of this, all right, when God is chastening us, uh, perhaps having to give us a spanking from heaven, as David Guzik said, uh, don't just let it go by and ignore it and get a sulky about it and upset about it and angry, but rather let it do something. Wherefore, as a result of this, lift up those hands that hang down. The hands always speak of strength, strength, all right? Uh, they've been hanging down, doing nothing for the Lord. And I always see when we lift up our hands to the Lord, it is surrendering ourselves to the Lord. We need to allow every chastening, every um, situation that we go through that is painful, that is uh, grievous, all right, uh, let it turn ourselves to God. Let it cause us to lift our hands once again uh, that have been hanging down doing nothing and surrender totally to the Lord and say, Lord, uh, I just want to do things your way. I want to yield myself to you and the feeble knees, you know, to walk, to walk. Your knees have to be working properly. And uh, feeble knees speak of sickness, speak of weakness, uh, tiredness, um, weakness, I would say, feeble, all right, feeble knees. It says, make straight paths for your feet. And that word straight is righteous paths, all right? Um, less that which is lame. In other words, if there's something lacking in your life, uh, it's not going to please God. It's not going to bring glory to God. God is not going to accept something that is not uh, fully good because he's not leaving it to you and me. We're not depending on our own efforts. If you remember um, before in the Old Testament, it was righteousness by works. In other words, they had to keep the law. They had to make sure they did things right. And this is 
righteousness by works and nobody could really fulfill it because the law said if you you know fail in one area you failed in everything so though you kept most of the law but there was one area you found it hard to do you were guilty of the whole thing so it was like an impossibility but it says here we need to make sure we're making um what is that word let me see there again uh straight paths all right for your feet not that which is crooked that which is going the wrong way doing the other thing uh, because our walk with the lord depends on his strength and therefore it says don't be lame don't be hobbling in this area or that area unable to walk properly because you're not depending on yourself you're depending on him and if you're gonna allow things in your life that you know are not according to god's way it's not going to be accepted by god it says but let it rather be healed a willingness to be healed a willingness you can look on your paper there all right to recognize our wrong desire to please god allow god to change us all right uh th this is the way to go it, it doesn't mean all of us in our practical walk now let's get this straight again i've mentioned it several times when we accept the lord in our spirit man it's a finished work we belong to the Lord, but now we have to put it into practice in our daily walk of life. According to what we read in the Bible, the way that God likes it, the way that God wants it. And if we really believe that we have been born again, that we are new creatures in Christ, and that it's God who gives us his righteousness and God who and, um, enables us and helps us. As we look to God, we will find that we are able to do what we never could do before, all right? And so we, we need to, it says, uh, let's go to 14 now and 15. So 12 and 13 is get strong by lifting up your hands to the Lord. All right. Uh, surrendering yourself to God, submitting yourself to God and crying out to him to help you, to enable you. So those knees and every time I read about feeble knees I, here, I said about walking. But for myself, every time I read feeble knees, I think of kneeling in prayer, all right, and say, Lord, um, these knees have not been kneeling to you and crying out to you and honoring you and recognizing my need for you. Help me, Lord. I surrender not only my arms, my hands, my you know, to you, but Lord, these knees, I surrender them to you. I don't want them to be weak and feeble when it comes to praying. I want to acknowledge you, all right? And as a result of surrendering to God, then I need to make straight paths. That means righteous uh, walk before me to go straight ahead not to let anything that is crooked or lame all right to be allowed in my life but once god shows me areas like i told you after that intense headache of over a week then the lord showed me what it was as i kept crying out to him he showed me it was unforgiveness in my life and he rectified an area of my life where I used to think I had to 
have somebody say sorry before I was willing to forgive. Sometimes they don't even know you're upset with them. How are they gonna say sorry? So when you're offended, you can choose to forgive and allow yourself to be healed. Let's read 14 and 15 now. Hebrews 12 verses 14 and 15. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. All right. Um, it's not only these two verses, it includes uh, 16 and 17, which I don't want to read right now because I, I'm not going to talk about them now, but 14 through 17 is get right. All right, get right. So you, uh, 14 through 17, we need to use God's strength to set things right in our manner of living. So the first one is pursue. Ours says follow but pursue peace with all people and holiness. This means to walk right with both men and to walk right with God, all right? Follow peace with all men. Be at peace with them. Uh, and that's where the forgiveness comes in. Uh, if you cannot be at peace with them, you need to choose to forgive them, all right? Uh, so pursue, uh, pursue peace with all people, not just those that you like, not those that are easy to get along with, but no matter who you come in contact with, on your part, you want to pursue peace. Some people just do not want to be at peace. Leave them to God. Don't get mad at them. Don't default them, don't condemn them. Just say, God help them. But on your part, you're going to uh, pursue peace with all men. And holiness, all right, is to walk right with God, all right? Discouragement makes us sloppy and unconcerned with holiness and personal relationships all right when we get discouraged and many times we allow discouragement to come into our life but i'm here to tell you that jesus never allowed discouragement discouragement is from the flesh and when you get discouraged that's when you start letting your hands hang down that's when your knees start getting feeble you just feel like giving up you don't feel like going ahead you don't feel like doing anything all right and when we get unconcerned about holiness that means our relationship with god and personal relationships it's very bad because it tells us here without holiness no man shall see the lord all right regarding holiness without that we will not see the lord so we see that a lack of holiness in our life is a real critical obstacle to a close relationship to god in fact spurgeon says unholy christians are the plague of the church unholy christians are the plague of the church, their spots in our feasts. All right, um, this thing of holiness is talking about growth. Uh, God gives us his holiness and on our part, it might be in the soul like a grain of mustard seed. Uh, it, it isn't fully developed yet in our daily walk, but it has begun. All right, or it may be in the heart as a wish and a desire, uh, but nothing is fully realized, but it has begun. And as we allow 
uh, as we grow in the Lord, as we get to know him more and more, as we begin to hear his voice uh, showing us things that don't please him and we obey him, that holiness begins to grow. Spurgeon describes four different types of people who try to get on in Christian life without holiness. I'll go slowly. The first one is the Pharisee. The Pharisee. They're confident in outward ceremonies rather than true holiness. I would say they're religious. Those who are very religious, but they don't have the goods, all right? They're satisfied because they go through all the outward ceremonies. The next one, he says, is the moralist, M-O-R-A-L-I-S-T, feels no need for holiness because his life is so good. We would call them self-righteous self-righteous. They think they're okay. They think everything they do is right. They only see everybody else's faults, but they never seem to see their own. The third one is the experimentalist. Their entire Christian life is lived inward, never looking to the outward conduct but only to feeling, as long as they feel okay, it's all right. They're not concerned with the conduct, but holiness shows itself in our conduct, all right? Um, and the last one is the opinionist. Their Christian life is all about believing the right doctrine, all right? They're very unconcerned about the way one lives, all right? Um, you know, we have to be very careful of this. Believing right doctrines is fine as long as it changes our lifestyle to fit in with those right doctrines. But just to, you know, um, be concerned with doctrine alone and fuss and fight about. I, I used to be like that, all right? And th there's a word for it. I can't remember right now, but I, I know that I was like that. I could argue, I could fight about, you know, um, what what is right and what is wrong and uh, is Jesus coming who he's coming for and is he coming before the tribulation or during it or after it? Oh, I, I could just really. Um, and you, you know what? Um, God had to take me through a few deep waters. And one day in a special meeting, he set me free from this. And I remember it was with my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law. Whenever we would go to visit them, it wouldn't be long before we would be into this thing and we would be fussing and arguing and having a big time. But after the Lord set me free and caused me to realize it isn't just believing with head knowledge in, in certain right doctrines, but it's applying them to our life and whether or not we are really living it out to show and prove that what we believe, all right, uh, in, in our lifestyle. So after God had done this great work in me, we went to visit my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and we hadn't um, been there too long before my brother-in-law brought up the subject. He wanted to get into this argument, and, uh, and I had always been like that. So once he started, but I never took the bait, and he tried different ways to introduce the subject, and I never 
took the bait. I never start, and he started to cry. And he said, "What has happened to you? You have changed." And then I was able to testify to him and tell him how the Lord had set me free from just having head knowledge about doctrines, but not being careful about my lifestyle. So I, I tell you, friends, a holy life is more than just believing in right doctrines. It is living it out in our life. So it says, looking diligently, verse 15, uh, and this looking, I've always thought it had to do with looking at Jesus, you know, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But I realized later, looking diligently, we not only have to look to him, but we need to look inwardly and make sure that things are going all right because it says here looking diligently lest uh, lest is like a word to beware uh, in case this might happen it could happen to anyone uh, lest any man fail or run out of the grace of god does god's grace ever run out can god's grace be gone i would like to say no god's grace is full and free and it never runs out god never changes and he has plenty of grace but your container and my container our heart our life our spirit can run out all right uh, and so we need to be very careful, not just to say, I believe in the grace of God, but to know that we're living by the grace of God. What is the grace of God? It is actually God's life. We don't deserve it. It includes every part of God, his abilities, his knowledge his power, his presence, whatever has to do with God uh, and God's life is grace. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us through Jesus. Isn't that right? So he says, looking diligently in case any person should run out of the grace of God. If you run out of the grace of God, the next step is less any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. All right. Bitterness, this is called a bitter root, is a root that bears bitter fruit. All right. Bitterness comes from the fact that you've been hurt, you've been offended. Uh, you're upset, you're angry with somebody, you're bitter over the way they treated you or didn't treat you. And um, this, it's a root. It's a seed that takes place and turns into a root. Roots, you don't see them. They're hidden. They're hidden down in the heart. But that root of bitterness is going to bring forth fruit. The fruit can be seen springing up. It will trouble you and thereby many are defiled. All right. It's a sense of personal hurt and many hold on to bitterness with amazing stubbornness. What they must do is remember the grace of God is extended to them. And therefore, we need to start extending that grace towards others, loving the undeserving. No matter what they've done to us, God forgives us. And nobody can ever hurt us more than we've hurt God. 
the wrongs we've done to God in our life before we ever came to him uh, are just unexplainable, uncountable. There's so many. And yet God, for Christ's sake, was willing to forgive us and forgive it all and get rid of it all. And so it says we need, we're talking about getting right. So if we run out of God's grace, we have nothing left but our own strength, our own life to run on. If you're not running on God's life, depending on God's life, drawing on God's life, then you're doing your own thing. You're back to square one, trying to produce what only God can produce in you. So it says, look diligently. Don't run out of grace because if you run out of grace, you're not going to be able to forgive. You'll get offended. You'll get angry. You'll be hurt. And the next thing you know, you're going to get bitter and it's going to spew out of you from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You'll start downing them, talking bad about them and so forth. And as a result, all right, many will be defiled, not just you, but your words as they come out are going to affect other people and the way they look at that person. All right. So, um, Let's go to the next one now, which is 16. We're talking about getting right, all right? Uh, getting right if we have any unforgiveness, uh, if we're not right with men, if we're not walking in the way of God, which is holiness, we need to get right. And then we need to make sure we're not running out of grace because then bitterness can come up. And bitterness will, in the end, affect many people. Now, 16 says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. All right, fornicator is talking about, um, here, it's talking about spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. Because we belong to God, when we love something more than what he has for us, we're committing spiritual fornication, all right? So it says a, a fornicator or profane. Profane is, you know, uh, like a rug on the floor. If a rug is put on the wall, like a picture, a beautiful uh, it's not profane, but when you put that rug in front of the door and you wipe your feet on it uh, to come into the house, it becomes profane. You, you dirty it up, you sully it up. And it says Esau was like that. Esau was Jacob's brother who for one morsel of meat, all right, sold his birthright. Let, let's talk about that story. Uh, Esau would go out and hunt. And one day he went out to hunt. And when he came back from hunting, he hadn't cooked what he killed yet. He was tired. He was hungry. He was worn out. And as he walked by Jacob, his brother's tent, he smelt red porridge. Whoa. Oh, it smelt good. And suddenly he realized how hungry he was, how weak he was, how tired he was, and that he was just needed to eat something. And the smell of that red porridge really got to him. So he, you know, asked Jacob, let me have some of your red pottage or your red porridge. And Jacob said, no, it's mine. I cooked it and um, you know, I don't mind exchanging with you. It, not for money, but if you have something I want, I have something you want, we'll make an even exchange. 
you can have my red porridge, but you have to let me have what I want. So Esau said, well, what do you want? He said, I want your birthright. Now the birthright was a spiritual blessing being though they were twins, all right? Um, the firstborn would always get double portion, a double blessing. It was definitely a spiritual thing. And Esau should have said, no way am I going to sell you my spiritual blessing, my spiritual inheritance um, for something that just is going to be momentary, something that's this life, just some food. This is where food can become um, God created all of us with an appetite and to eat. If we don't eat, we will die. But food can take first place till food becomes more important than God in our life. Food becomes more important than the spiritual. And at that moment, Esau let his natural mind, his carnal mind, uh, come into play and he said I'm going to die if I don't get this food I'm on the brink of death what good is my spiritual birthright anyways so he exchanged the spiritual for the natural all right and I would like to say like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Many Christians today sell a birthright of intimacy with God as cheaply as Esau sold his birthright, all right? It was just a momentary decision and it satisfied him momentarily he had to eat more later on, but it satisfied that momentary craving. But he took something that was eternal and lasting and sold it away for something momentary. And too many of us, we are so intent on satisfying ourselves in the natural, all right? friendships, hobbies, food, sleep, so many different things that there's nothing wrong with them in themselves. But when that becomes more important than spending intimate time with the Lord, we are exchanging that spiritual for the momentary all right verse 17 says for you know how that afterward when he would have inherited there came a time he wanted that blessing because he never died that day he continued to live he continued to go on and the day came for his father to die that was when his father was going to bless him. And that's when he wanted the blessing, but he was rejected because the blessing was, he had sold it. Of course, the father didn't know that, uh, but the father had already given that blessing to Jacob, all right? And by the time Esau came, he said, isn't there a blessing for me? He said, I already gave it all to your brother. He came and took it away. It said he found no place of repentance. So there are some things that you can sin and you can be forgiven. But when you take something that is yours rightfully in the realm of the spirit, and you exchange it and you sell it off and you exchange, you you can never once you give it away once you reject it once you despise your 
the spiritual and say that the other is worth more and you have to have that and you can do without the other that is something that you can never repent of even though he sought it carefully with tears all right it is not a question of forgiveness god's forgiveness is always open to the penitent Esau could have come back to God, but he could never undo that act. He could never undo it. He gave it away. And all right, so th these are the areas 14 to 17. We need to get it right with God. All right. 12 and 13 was get strong. Now, 18 to 21 is to um be bold all right get bold Let, let's read here um 18 and 19 shall we read that first hebrews 12 verses 18 and 19 for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that word should not be spoken to them anymore. Okay. Now, actually, this part that we're going to start on now um, is comparing Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, all right? Um, this is talking about in Exodus 19, 10 to 25, it, what was it like when they came to Mount Zion? This mountain was fenced off. There was no trespassing on pain of death. They were commanded to wash their clothes and abstain from all sexual relations. There was thunder, there was lightning, there was a thick cloud. There was a sound of a trumpet calling forth the nation to meet with God. There was more smoke like a furnace and earthquakes. It says the trumpet sounded long until Moses spoke and God himself answered. God spoke to Israel from Sinai, but warned them in every way possible, stay away, stay away, stay away. So Mount Sinai is a fearful thing uh, when, if that represents righteousness by works, it will never bring us to God, all right? Nobody in their own strength, in their own, uh, there's no boldness. There was nothing but fear, fearfulness. Even Moses said, all right, uh, he, he was afraid, all right? And those that heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. The reaction of Israel was understandable. They were actually terrified. They wanted the experience to stop and not to continue. And like I said about Moses, he said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. He said that in Deuteronomy 9.19 when he was talking about Mount Sinai. But all of this fear, all right, this is not the fear of God. This is natural fear. When we try in our own effort to be holy, to be righteous, the thought of God is frightening and scary. But all this fear did not succeed in promoting holiness among the people. It did not succeed in changing the heart of Israel, because 40 days later, 
they were found even after all that fear and trembling and, and the smoke and the lightning and the uh, thundering and so forth that went on and they were so frightened. But 40 days later, they were found worshiping a golden calf and claiming that that was the God that brought them out of Egypt. But this part is we're to be bold, all right, because we have come to Mount Zion. I think that we will stop here and take our break, all right? Um, we will come back at maybe a, a bit after 10, all right? 10.05. Okay. Okay, you know, I noticed that I got caught up with talking and I, I didn't go according to our book. So let's go back to our page 48 and start with D, all right? The warning against defaulting from grace, lest any man should fail of the grace of God or fall short, meaning running out of God's grace. What is grace? the unmerited favor of God, it's the very life of God. Would you read to us 1 Timothy 1.14? 1 Timothy 1.14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Yeah, so this tells us everything we need for the Christian life, all right? Uh, faith toward God and love toward our fellow man. That's all that we need to live this Christian life the way that we're supposed to. And it's found in Christ. Uh, read also 1 Corinthians 1.14. 1 Corinthians 1.14. 1.4 uh, or 1.14? 1.4. One for I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Yeah, so God's grace, God's life is given to us by Jesus. And then C says, Where is it obtained? Hebrews 4:16. Hebrews 4:16. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to, oh, sorry, I think I've got the wrong one. Give me a minute. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the, grace, the, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yeah, so that this is telling where it's obtained at the throne of God. It comes because of Jesus, all right? You have to come in Jesus' name. Whatever you receive from God is via Jesus, but it's at God's throne. God's throne in the Old Testament was called a throne of judgment, but in the new, because of Jesus, it's called the throne of grace, where we can receive grace to help in time of need. When we have a need, we can cry out to the Lord anytime and every time. There's no set place where the throne of God is. You can be anywhere. And if you have a need that can become a throne of grace as you cry to the Lord. And then we're told, let us have grace. That was found in verse 28. We haven't reached 28 yet, but would you go down and read that for us? Yes, Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Yeah, so we are responsible 
to have grace. All right, according to that. Uh, we read and earlier we talked about make sure that you look diligently that you haven't run out of grace. But at the chapter ends, let us have. It, it is a responsibility for us to make sure as a Christian, you're not running on your own steam. Make sure it's not your own efforts and a bunch of head knowledge, because head knowledge will not help you at all. What head knowledge does is to help you to turn to God, to know about it. If you don't know anything about it, then you would never go to get it. So to know it is to go to God. And like Jesus said in that one portion, he said, uh, you think you search the scriptures search the scriptures in them you think you have life and you won't come to me say that you might have that life so uh, scriptures by themselves if they don't cause us just knowing what's in the bible if it doesn't turn us to cry out to god to receive what we read about it's no point just knowing it doesn't help we need to cry out for the strength, all right, because God's grace helps us to serve God in an acceptable manner. That's why when people can, you know, talk about God, oh, that man upstairs, oh, this, that, in a very kind of a derogatory way, all right, I, I don't really believe they're, they've got the grace of God in them because God's life would never talk about God or Jesus in a derogatory way, all right? God's grace will help us to have a very reverential attitude to revere God, to know that he's right. And a godly fear is not being afraid of God but we don't want to hurt God. We don't want to disappoint God. We don't want to go after things that God doesn't like. That's called godly fear. All right. Uh, let us have grace. There is no substitute. Self-effort is totally unacceptable. And uh, at, to serve God acceptably, all right, love, covers a multitude of sin god is love and when he puts his love in our heart so that we begin to exemplify it we begin to act it out and live it then you know we really have the grace of god and going there to number two lest any root of bitterness springing up all right uh how by running out of God's grace and life, uh, taking our eyes off God, then we start seeing man and his faults. And may I say, I've said it before in other classes, the devil tries to keep us from looking at the Lord and keeping our eyes on the Lord. He'll try to divert us to situations, circumstances, people, or whatever they have done. But the moment you run, start running out of grace, you're, you'll fall for it. If you're full of the grace of God, uh, you, you refuse to allow yourself to look at people and their faults. Uh, because once you see man and his faults, we get hurt, we get bitter, and um, that defiles many. And of course, by not forgiving, then I, I went into this three, that's the end of 48. Um, Esau, go over to page 49. Esau is used as an example, exchanging the spiritual for fleshly gratification for momentary pleasure. Esau's bitter consequences when he wanted the blessing he was rejected when he wanted to repent he found no place of repentance he wept bitterly but he was denied okay from 
verse 18 to 29, our true position as believers by faith, all right? We're going to start comparing the two dispensations, all right, and what they represent. Mount Sinai represents the system of the law, which depended on man's efforts, all right, and brought weakness and failure, all right. Uh, it was outward, it was visible, it was tangible, but it was untouchable and unapproachable. Uh, even though Mount Sinai could be seen so clearly, yet it was, we were, they were unable to touch God or to approach God. Um, read for us Psalms 143 verse 2. Psalms 143 verse 2. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Yeah. No man living. That means if, if you're under the law, if you're, you're, you cannot be justified by your own dealings and in God's sight, all right? God's holiness, God's justice is just too far ahead. We're gonna read now, starting with 18, 18, 19, and 20 to get us kind of back into sync again, all right? And 21, will you read that? Hebrews 12, verses 12, uh, verses- No, 18 to 21, yeah. Verses 18 to 21. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the sound and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain. It shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Yeah. All right. But let's start now with 22. All right. Because, like I already read to you, Mount Sinai is really, it represents the system of the law. It depended on their own works, their weaknesses, their failures. And though outwardly they could see it, it was tangible, yet God's presence through the law could not be, you couldn't touch God, you couldn't really approach him. But we are come to Mount Zion. This is 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Yes. All right, so we haven't come to that Mount Sinai. You, you, you couldn't be bold there. All that brought was fear. And when we try to depend on ourselves, we just cannot have faith. We cannot have assurance. It says the full assurance of faith. Faith always brings such confidence and assurance because it's based on God and what God can do. But when it's the the law and the efforts of man, we know we cannot do, and it always brings so much fear. But this get bold is because we have not come to Mount Sinai. God has two mountains. Mount Sinai was the first, and he has this second one, which is Mount Zion, all right? 
this represents the grace of God or the kingdom of God. It depends on God and the finished work of Christ. It brings life and power. It brings fulfillment and it brings perfection. All right. Uh, God's love and grace have been made available to us through Jesus. Let's read John 1, 14 and 16. John 1, verses 14 and 16. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 16. And of his fullness have we all we received, have, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Yeah. So Jesus is full of grace. Jesus is full of the life of God. And of his fullness, we keep drawing from him. Whenever we have a need, we can draw that life into our situation. His life, God's life. God's ability, God's know-how, all right? Uh, you know, it has to do with God's knowledge. He knows everything. So when you need to know something, you cry out to God and God will, he'll, he'll let you realize it. He'll uh, give you the answer, whatever it might be, all right? He will make it available to you, either through a dream a vision, or he will speak it, or he will show you a book where to find the answer. Uh, he will let you know what it is. Um, you don't have the right answers. You cry out to God, God will give you the right answer, right? Uh, because you're in Christ, you're part of Christ. So it says, of his fullness, we've all received grace for grace. As you draw grace, the life of God to meet this need, then you come back again and you draw again. It's all, um, like it says under B, his throne is called the throne of grace, where we cry out to him. I found that I need that regularly and constantly. Um, it, it's a story I've told many times, but whenever a story comes out of the blue, I figure I need to tell it. Um, you know, when I was in Bible college and we were studying the book of Romans, Romans 5, 15, um, I just didn't understand what that verse was, what it meant. It said, by one man, sin came into this earth by one man's sin sin came upon all men and by one man's righteousness many were made righteous but it uses the word much more it claims that second is much more and at the time i didn't understand that i said lord to me it looks very through natural understanding one sinner equals many sinners. One righteous man equals many righteous. One equals many. One equals many. That's all I could see. But it said much more. Claim the end. The last was much more. Actually, I prayed to God for almost three years before I got an answer from him. God doesn't always Give, if your answer is life and death, you'll get it immediately. But when it's not life and death, many times he doesn't answer you. He wants to know, you know, do, do you really, are you really interested or are you just saying things like that? I, I remember one time and... Um, Anyways, wherever, if I come to it, if I have to tell it again sometime, I'll tell it. But I remember one time when I was crying out to the Lord, Lord, 
what is your will for me? And, and I was desperate to know the will of God. And God finally answered me. He said, why should I tell you? You don't plan to do it anyways. He, he knew ahead. I wasn't wanting to know. I wanted to make sure I was right. I was evidently having an argument with somebody about something. And I just needed to know I was right. I, I wasn't wanting to know what God wanted to go obey him and do it. And he said, why should I tell you? You don't plan to keep it anyways. But going back to my first story, uh, after about three years, uh, I already was married. I now had two children, my first girl, uh, my second girl was a baby and on breast milk and I was feeding her. And I read that verse again. And I remember saying to God, God, I've been asking you for how long? Why do you say much more? Now, he didn't tell me with words. He showed me in a vision. That means I was sitting there. My eyes are open. It wasn't a dream. And he showed me a box of apples full of Washington delicious apples, red, beautiful apples piled up in this wooden crate. And then he gave me, I call them x-ray eyes, because suddenly I could see into the middle of that box to one round apple, all right? And that round apple was rotten in the middle. And then pretty soon, every apple that was touching it became rotten, rotten, rotten. Then the apples that touched that ring, they became rotten. Pretty soon, the whole box became rotten. And I, God never said anything. I saw it and I said, I understand that, God, you know. That, that happens in my fridge every once in a while when I'm not careful and something gets bad. If I don't remove it pretty soon, it makes the next thing bad and the next thing bad till the whole drawer is rotten. And then God showed me this box full of rotten apples and gave me those x-ray eyes again to look into the middle. And I saw one beautiful Washington delicious apple in the middle of all these rotten apples. And pretty soon the apples that touched that good apple, boom, 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 they became good, all right? And then that, boom, 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 they all became good till the whole box was, and I cried out. God never said a word then. I, no, God, that's impossible. That is not natural. And then is when God spoke, he said, that's why much more. One sinner can produce many sinners. That's very natural. But one righteous man cannot produce many righteous men. That's supernatural. That's supernatural. God, I've never forgotten that lesson. God taught it to me. All right. So we can cry out to the Lord and the Lord will give us answers okay d all right um no c heavenly and spiritual spiritual birth the city of the living god where he lives and dwells heavenly jerusalem through spiritual citizenship all right um all right Blessings and relationships. Let's look there. I have let's read this 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, 
and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Yeah, so the blessings and relationships in Mount Zion, all right? Church of the firstborn. They're written in heaven. They have that spiritual birthright, right? God, who is the judge of all who have ever lived, all right, and of all those who have ever preceded us, this is what we've come to when we come to Mount Zion. It is in the kingdom of God, all right? And Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. That was what it said in 24. Now, let, let's go to 23 to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. I believe that it is differentiating. Some people think it's talking about the same thing. The general assembly is there, all of them, but the church of the firstborn, they're the ones that have that spiritual birthright, all right? I believe they will be the bride of Jesus Christ. And they're written in heaven. And when we come to Mount Zion, we're coming to God, the judge of all. Don't think when we come to God, uh, I mean, come to, um, to Jesus and accept the Lord, that God is not judge. He's still judging. He is still working and he's the judge of everyone. All of us are going to face the judgment seat of Christ, all right? And we're coming to the spirits of just men that have been made perfect, all right? Those that died before us, um, Mount Zion, they're, they're going to be in God's kingdom. God, they, they were not lost. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant in, under that old one. We realize that um, Moses was the mediator, all right? And as far as the angels, it says we're coming to an innumerable company of angels. Well, it just took a couple, three angels to bring the law uh, into Moses' hands. But when we come to Mount Zion, it's to... You can't number them. There's so many angelic beings there. Amen. All right. And um, in verse 24, not only have we come to Jesus, the mediator, he paid it all. There's only one mediator of this new covenant. There is no two. It's not Mary and then Jesus. It's not go to the saints and the saints go to Mary. No, no, no. It's we go straight to Jesus. That kind of teaching that you go to the saints or you have to go to Mary and uh, who, who can um, like coerce Jesus more, the mother of Jesus. So we'll go to, the, no, you're trying to say that Jesus is hard to reach. No. I tell you, friends, when we've been born into the kingdom of God, we get there straight by going to Jesus. Salvation does not come through one or two mediators. There's only one. Jesus is the only one. He's the one that paid the full price. And the blood of sprinkling that it is talking about here that speaketh better things. Now, um, I never saw it like that before, but um, there is, yes, Abel, he offered a blood sacrifice of a goat or a lamb. And we know that that doesn't have perfection in it that doesn't have permanence because they had to keep offering it over and over 
But to me, the main thing that's talked about here is when Abel died, his blood was shed. He was murdered by Cain, if you remember right. And God spoke to Cain and said, the blood of your brother Abel cries to me. It was crying for vengeance. He couldn't avenge himself. He was murdered. His life was taken away from him. His blood spoke of somebody needs to, to justify. Somebody needs to pay back the, the evil that was done. So his blood cried for vengeance, whereas Jesus' blood cries for mercy. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. All right. Um, so the danger, we're going to go over to page 50. The danger of presuming on God's grace, we're not coming to Mount Sinai, representing God's holiness and severity, which brings judgment, wrath, fear, terror. We are come to Mount Zion, representing God's love, which brings mercy and grace, which often is taken for granted presumed upon by thinking God will overlook mistakes. God will wink at sin. What we don't realize is, all right, um, when it says to Jesus, the mediator, Mount Sinai was all about an old covenant based on earning and deserving. But Mount Zion is based on a new covenant with Jesus, the mediator, based on believing and receiving. Amen. Um, and as far as what it's talking about here, some people presume, all right, they, they, that God is going to overlook. But you will find if you read in the Old Testament, God showed a lot more mercy there, loving kindness, uh, overlooking a lot of their things, all right? Whereas in the New Testament, we, you don't realize it, but God is holding us more accountable than those of the old because we have a closer relationship to him. We have more of his word. We have the New Testament given that explains a lot of those Old Testament things. So instead of thinking that grace will overlook and therefore you can get by with a slipshod way uh, of God will overlook your mistakes. God will wink at sin. No, he won't. There's a lot more judgment that is going to be required of us because more privilege demands greater responsibility on our part. We are to realize the seriousness of sin under the new covenant. The punishment of sin is greater than under the old covenant. Greater privileges bring greater responsibility. Neglect of these brings greater punishment. Look at Hebrews 2, 2 and 3. Would you read that for us, sister? Hebrews 2, verses 2 and 3. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Yeah. So if they, you know, two or three witnesses, that's all it took uh, under the Old Testament for you, you, you to be killed. But it's saying here, how shall we escape? There's no way to escape. They couldn't escape then. And even more now, we're not going to be able to escape, all right? Let's look at Hebrews 10, 
26 to 30, which talks of God's judgment. Hebrews 10, 26 to 30. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much, of how much uh, sorrow punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and unholy things and unholy thing and had done despite unto the grace unto the spirit of grace for we know him that hath said vengeance belongeth unto me and i will recompense saith the lord and again the lord shall judge his people it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god yes so uh it shows us that sinning, you know, when you know the truth, when you know what is expected, when you know what is taught, and then you turn around and go against it, it is a terrible thing. There's no way to escape God's vengeance, all right? We're going to go to our last portion before we close today, C our true position as believers by faith, the warning against refusing God's voice. Let's read verse 25. This is the watch out now. We, the get bold uh, was just a moment here. Get bold is from 18 to 24. Then watch out is 25, okay? Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. 26. Right. 26. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shall shake not the earth only, but also heaven. All right, let's look on our paper here. The danger of sin. C, you need to underline that. C, make sure that you refuse not him that speaketh. God is speaking through Jesus every day. All the time he's speaking, all right, if we have an ear to hear if we want the consequences of sin, there is no escape. If they escape not after refusing Moses, how can we escape if we turn away from him, all right? And that's of course talking about Christ. If we turn away from him, I know of a man that was actually not just a Christian, baptized in the Holy Spirit and became a preacher. All right. He was a preacher of the word. And one day he, he had a family, a wife and um, three children. Yeah, and one day he came and he informed his wife that he realized he was actually gay. He was a homosexual. And therefore, um, he was leaving her and the children and he was gonna go and uh, get together with this other man. Uh, I, I will tell you, that is, I don't know about you, I have to leave, God alone is the judge. If he ever comes back, I doubt it. I doubt it because he experienced the things of God. He experienced the Holy Spirit. 
he had the word, he was teaching the word for how many years he was doing this. And then suddenly he decides he's this other and he's going to go and, and leave this marriage and go and into this other kind of, a, a, no, 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 no. Yeah. Anyways, like I say, none of us can be the judge to say, he can never find peace, but that is about a very, very dangerous ground to, for years, be proclaiming the Lord and his, and then turn and go back into not just normal living, but go back into what you know the Word of God teaches against. It says there's going to be no escape. All right, three. Uh, that was verse 26 that we read, whose voice then shook the earth. All right. That's from Mount Sinai. But now he's promised once more, I'm not only going to shake the earth, but I'm going to shake heaven itself. Uh, the greatness of the sin, awesome presence of God, awesome power of God. All right. Um, would you read Mark 13, 25 for us? Mark 13, 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Yeah. So th th this is telling us um, what's there, there's going to be some terrible things. The stars, once in a while you see a shooting star, but here it says, when the powers in heaven are shaken, these stars are going to just fall all over the place. Um, the greatness of the sin, we have to realize that when we turn away from Christ, how awesome that presence is, how awesome that power is, how awesome his promise is, the promise of God about the day of judgment. So 27 explains 26 to us. Hebrews 12, 27. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yeah. We have received, which is what 28 tells us, a kingdom can, that cannot be shaken. God's kingdom can never be shaken. I don't care what the judgment of God is. God's kingdom will stand forever and ever. It will rise above it all. It will be untouchable. All right. That's what it tells us. All right. Uh, in 28, that we receiving a kingdom, which is a spiritual kingdom, which cannot be moved, all right? But it says here in 27, when he says yet once more, it's telling not of a localized judgment, but it's telling of the great judgment of God, all right? That is going to remove anything that can be shaken. It's going to be Heaven and earth is going to pass away, all right? Uh, it, it's going to be gone. Mountains are going to be gone. Everything that we've seen and known as very stable and solidified and we think can never move. That's why the Lord says, um, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. One day, this heaven and earth that we're looking at now will not be here. One day it's going to be torn apart. One day it's going to catch on fire and be burnt up totally. But praise the Lord, anything that cannot be shaken will remain. Anything that can be shaken that is not of God's kingdom is going to be totally destroyed, totally, um, you know, removed, amen, in the day of judgment. Uh, it's temporary, 
the removing of those things which can be shaken, the remaining of the spiritual that cannot be shaken will remain. Only the spiritual. So friends, you and I have a part of us that is natural. The outer man is natural. This world is natural. We live here. We have to live here. But we don't have to be part of all of this. We don't have to take part. We don't have to enjoy it, depend on it, and get wrapped up in it and learn to love it. Because God has already told us it is going to end. It's going to end with terrible noise and a fire that's beyond uh, human idea. Fire will come down from heaven and literally consume it all. It will be totally destroyed. All right. And but if we have a part in us that is spiritual, we must live for that. We must cater to that. We must do the will of God. We must follow what the Lord wants. All right. Um, so read 28 and 29. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And our God is a consuming fire. Yeah. Mine says, for our God is a consuming fire. So bearing that in mind, don't just think of God as a God of love. You only think of God as a God of love, you will tend to take advantage of him. But when you constantly remember, all right, uh, God is God. He is the only God. He is a God of love, but he is a God of holiness. And if we bear that in mind at all time, then we need to serve him acceptably. Not the way you think is okay. Not the way you think I can get by with this, I can get by with that. No, we need to serve God the way he expects to be served. That is reverentially and with godly fear. And the only way we can do that is by his grace, by his life. Only his life knows what God is really like and can reveal that to our spirit. And as we live like that, let's remember our God is a consuming fire. He's one that judges sin. So don't play games with sin, all right? The preventative against sin being part of his kingdom where he rules in righteousness in holiness, put at the side of this in our daily lives. Where he rules in righteousness, in holiness, bracket that, in our daily lives, anchored in G Christ, firmly in Christ, not wavering in our faith. Having the grace of God to serve God acceptably, all right, his life, new and fresh, his ability to daily enable us to face whatever we're going to face in that day. Our God is a consuming fire. Please read Isaiah 27, 4 and 5. Isaiah 27, verses 4 and 5. Fury is not in me, who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle. I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let them, or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Yeah, so this is saying, um, it isn't that our God is a consuming fire, it means that he has a nature that he's an angry God. That's what the devil wants us to think. He's an angry. No, he's not an angry God. He's a loving God, but he's a holy God. All right. His nature is fire. And if you bring 
anything like wood, hay, stubble and put it in front of fire. It's not because fire is angry. It's just the nature of fire will burn up anything uh, that is of that sort of uh, substance, all right? So sin, if you and I want to have sin in our life, we love this, we love that, and, and we want to have that in our life. When we face God, that nature of fire is going to burn it up. God's nature is fire. His nature is not anger. His nature is fire. And fire burns up anything that is combustible. And sin is definitely something that the nature of God will destroy and judge and burn up. And this is why we need to let us have grace. There's no way to live this Christian life without God's life. And so daily cry out, Lord, I can't do it on my own. Lord, I need you. I need your grace. Fill me with your grace. Help me to walk in your grace, in your love, in your holiness. And as you draw from him day by day, you will make it to the end. Amen. So we're going to stop. And um, we've only got one more chapter. There's five pages. So I don't know if we will finish it all next week or not, but we will start if we don't finish it. Whatever we don't finish that following week, that's all we will do. We're not going to start something brand new. We'll just go till we finish chapter 13. All right. Whether it takes one week or whether it takes two weeks, we've come to the end of this book of Hebrews. All right. Um, shall we bow our heads right now? Father, I just pray that we will understand how important it is for us to have a life full of the grace of God, full of the life of God. Lord, sometimes we just think we know it all. We can do it on our own and we stop depending on you. Help us by today's lesson to realize we need your grace. We need your, and thank you, Lord, that you do chasten us and chastise us, that you are very interested in seeing that our faith, which is born of God, develops and solidifies and takes root and that we're grounded in you. And depending on you and looking to you, Father, if there's any one of us today that we have become lax and we start just going by our head knowledge, waken us up, Lord, to know we need to have your grace. May we repent and turn away from whatever it is that we're just going our own way, depending on ourself, looking to ourself to produce. May we daily acknowledge your greatness, your love, your holiness, your grace, your life, how much we need you, how much we are so grateful and thankful to you for all that you have provided us. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, cover us with your blood. And may we live for you. May we determine today, a new and a fresh, we're going to live as unto you 
recognizing how much we need you. Not that we're going to grow up and never need you. The more we grow up, the more we're going to realize how much we need you and your strength and your life and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you on Thursday for the next class.